Welcome, everybody. I am really delighted that you've come out here for the first of our um, uh, speaker series events this week that's being co-sponsored um, by the Yale Climate and Energy Institute and the Yale uh, Center for Environmental Law and Policy. My name is Doug Kaiser. I teach at the law school. I'm inter interim director of the Center for Environmental Law and Policy. I'm delighted that Mark Pagani, the director of YCEI, is here as well. Uh, we are kicking off a, a series of four events this semester that we've called the C words, talking about addressing climate change without talking about climate change. And you can probably immediately understand the political context that's motivated that theme. And we have a great speaker uh, to kick off our first event of the semester. I'm going to introduce the associate director of YSELP, who will introduce our speaker. Um, the associate director has been working alongside our climate and energy fellow, Bruce Ho. Bruce, wave your hand. Thanks. Um, the associate director is named Joshua Galperin. Uh, Josh and Bruce have been putting together this speaker series. And uh, Josh is the, as I said, the new associate director of YSELP. He's a graduate of Vermont Law School and the MEM program here at FES. We're very excited to have him on board at the center. Um, so without further ado, Josh. Okay, folks, thanks for coming. I'll try to be real brief in my introduction because Kiari has a lot of good things to say. So let me just start by saying that this is a talk, it's about PR, that's what Kiari does. And we did make one of the fatal PR mistakes, which is uh, putting a, a few people in a very big room. This is actually, I think, a really good turnout, but we're in you know, Bowers, and that means it looks a little smaller than it is, but I assure you, there's a lot of people here learning. So this is actually, this is good, and it looks better than I thought it would. Um, so, let me tell you real quickly how I know Kiari and how I thought of bringing her on board here. I used to work at a group in, uh, based in Knoxville, Tennessee called the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. And uh, on, in my waning days there, we were working on a project to try to reform the Alabama Power Company, uh, which is a very heavily coal-dependent utility. And of course, coal equals climate change. And um, we knew that we could not talk about climate change when we were trying to convince people in Alabama that they had to start thinking about how their electricity was generated and why their electricity rates were as high as they were. And, and we knew that this had to be a conversation about something other than climate change. It had to be about uh, a, a number of things, finance, uh, personal choice, um, uh, saving money, whatever it was, it couldn't be climate change. So we ran into uh, Kiari and, and one of her colleagues, Eric Frankowski, and they said, we would love to get involved in this effort. So um, we, we engaged with Resource Media, Kiari's group, where she is a vice president and works on the um, climate and energy issues, climate, energy, and environment issues for resource media. And they came in and gave us all these great ideas about how to deal with climate problems in Alabama specifically, but without talking about the climate problems that we were trying to address. So Kiari was a, a huge help in getting that off the ground, and I, and I don't know how it's proceeded because I left. And maybe Kiari will have something to say about that in this talk, I'm not sure. but. Um, but the great part was not just all the knowledge that Kiari brought to the table, but the actual enthusiasm she brought. A lot of us working in the Southeast, we got pretty down pretty quickly. Uh, and, it, and it became hard to be really enthusiastic about what we were doing. But Kiari came in and she was you know, smiling and happy. And at one point, for some reason that I don't really remember, somebody at the group handed out pipe cleaners. Like, you know, they wanted us to, they said, if you have something to distract yourself with tactilely while we're having this discussion, then you'll focus better. And by the end of the discussion, Kiari had made um, this little sort of mole insect thing that I actually asked if I could have because I wanted to bring it to my wife because I thought it was adorable. And I gave it to her as a gift. And it's still sitting in my house uh, or my apartment back in Knoxville, which we still have, unfortunately. So That's anyway. where it went. Where yeah, did that it, go? It, so it's, it's in Knoxville, and, and Kiari is here. So um, I hope that her enthusiasm is uh, infectious to all of you and you learn something here. And Kiari, thank you very much for joining us. Nice. Thank you. That was a really good introduction. I love the stories. We're going to talk more about storytelling later, but that's what people probably remember more is when you tell a story about someone or about something. So hopefully when you leave the room, you'll remember that I'm good at making pipe cleaner animals. That's my goal. That's the only goal of my presentation. But thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, let's get just the logistics out of the way. Who am I? What am I doing here? Josh gave you a good intro. A lot of the work that we do at Resource Media is 
just about finding common connections to communicate better across shared values that people have. And we work predominantly around environmental issues and public health issues. So we get to choose, and that goes across everything from energy efficiency, renewable energy, toxics, coal, as we were talking about, coal fire power plant retirement, coal export, um, you name it, water, water health, uh, clean water, uh, public land, all of those things are really communication challenges, but at the end of the day, it's about finding the things that connect people or connect people emotionally to something and sending messages out. So we help people do a better job at that, and that's why I love my job. It's very difficult. We work with a whole host of different kinds of people from analysts, scientists, advocates, um, community members, city planners, just to help them all connect the dots they're trying to connect. So that said, let's move right along. Um, I have a lot of, I guess the first step here is gonna be moving the slides. Here we go. So I have a lot of slides and my goal is to engage. So as I told folks when they were early birds, I'm going to pick on people in the audience so that we can have more of a dialogue and I'm not talking at you, I'm sort of talking with you. Kind of. Um, so the presentation is really going to show you a, a few major things. How people understand climate change, um, basically your message, and then some elements of what works and what we know doesn't work so well, the lessons learned. Um, so how people understand climate change in general, if you're trying to communicate about climate change or not communicate about it, the best thing is just to look at what you know about who you're talking to. And you know, a lot of times in communications, we turn to public opinion research and a lot of the great work that people do. And I'm starting, a, of course, in your backyard because a lot of the best work has been done here. And um, in communications, it's not about necessarily just the best message. It's about the best message for the right audiences. And you have to understand what people actually listen to and what they hear. And thinking about how to craft your language in a way that resonates directly with who you're trying to reach. So a lot of times you know you'll run into friends and colleagues who are skeptical about climate change. Definitely not here. But in the world, um, you, you find that more and more in different places. Like it was Margaret who's from the Midwest, right? Where are you from again? Iowa. Iowa. So in Iowa, do you think you're going to run into a lot of skeptics? Well, actually, I'm from Iowa City, which is very like, liberal. Like, the rest of Iowa, for sure. For sure, for sure. And a lot of times it's not just saying, forget it, they you know, don't get it. It's about figuring out how to reach them. And you know, cognitive research shows that when you have a contra controversial topic where you know people have different kinds of views, you have to figure out what are their ideologies? What can I resonate with? What are their values? And when you come in that door, you can find that those people will actually listen to a message that they might turn off from. So really a lot of the, the starting points are around what you actually know. And you know, Dan Kahn, I, I think we, you know, I hope you know who he is. Raise your hand if you know who he is. Okay, good, that's good news in a way because if you don't, I'm actually engaging you in the experts that are in your backyard. So he, with, the, with the, co the Cultural Cognition Project, is doing a lot of great work in figuring out how to resonate with people and really how to present, um, present information or facts that are not counter to people's values or ideologies by understanding you know, how you can sink in with where people are. We always say at Resource Media, you're not going to be as successful trying to bring people where you are until you meet them where you are, or where they are. So in figuring out how you meet people where you are, you have to understand um, and, and figure out what you know about how they hear information or receive information. So here we go. We're going to start talking about the difference between persuasive communication and educational communication. So Tyler. If I just asked you, what's the difference between persuasive communication and educational communication, what would you think? I would think persuasive communication is trying to reach your 
work and pressure to get someone to do something. And education communication, just trying to get them the most relevant information. Education, yeah, education communication, trying to get them the most relevant information. Good, I, I think that's generally it. And I would just take the word force out of there and say, you know, persuasive communication is about basically trying to get a response by communicating something. And it, that could be a change in behavior, a change in attitude, um, some specific type of action. And educational information, educational communications, like you said, is really to inform people, to make sure you're getting the information out in the right way. And you're really looking for what we call reach and frequency and not necessarily measuring a response. So reach and frequency in communications is how many people I might have reached by sending out my message, by sending out my information, and how often I'm sending it out. So that's how you know you're informing versus persuasive communications where you're saying, am I causing a change? Am I producing some kind of change in attitude, change in belief, action? So we're really talking about two different things. And a lot of the communication that we see around environment and public health is to get people to do something, to put pressure on policymakers. So the persuasive communications, ideally. So you're trying to counter existing beliefs and get people to possibly change them or do something. So here's a, a sort of golden rule in, in persuasive communications. It's not necessarily what you say, um, that's important, but it's who says it. So if I was saying that the messenger is important, Minnie, what would you think that means? The message is important, but what about the messenger? Exactly. So you use a great word around this, trustworthy or credible. So it's, you know, if you're trying to reach farmers, let's say, and, and really to help them see the link between climate change and drought and its effect on their, their crops, their, pl their planting patterns, all of those things. You know, me coming out there being perceived sometimes as a, as a climate advocate or a wacky enviro, I may not be the best messenger, but there are farmer champions who get this who you leverage to deliver a message. So it's that golden rule of not just think about what you're gonna say, think about who should be saying it. And a lot of the work we do is about getting folks to know they're not the right messenger and to figure out the strategy behind not just what you say to reach people or change people, persuade people, but who should say it. So that's a really important piece of the work. Um, I don't know if any of you have read this article. Um, raise your hand if you've seen this article. Now, this article is a recent article that was in the Stanford um, Social Innovation Review uh, and my alma mater, so I'm gonna use this first. I'm talking about you guys more later. Um, but you know, it really is a great article and I, I recommend it to all of you because it touches on the, the sort of cultural aspect of this, the politicism of climate change and what you do about it, what we know about it and what you can do about it. So this article really, um, you know, it talks about how, you know, even beneficial information can, for people, can be hazardous by the way you pre present it. People will perceive things, read things in certain ways, but it really confronts that, you know, in when you look at the world view of folks, sometimes the, the folks who are making decisions about what to say, they don't understand that not everyone shares their worldview. And I think that's the, one, the most important part of it, making decisions in communication. It's both being informed and also knowing you're likely not sharing the worldview of the people that you're trying to reach. Perhaps you are. If you're trying to reach your base, let's say, you're trying to reach more folks within the environmental movement to get them to do something then you are you know, preaching to the choir or trying to expand the choir from just the soprano section to an alto section and a bass section and a tenor section. But a lot of cases, we're, we're essentially trying to move not just the choir, but the folks possibly sitting on the fence or the folks who might jump on the fence. And that's a different story altogether. So you know, this article really talks about you know, how you can look at 
the differences in how people perceive climate change and how you look at sort of how the, the world views and create different concept, concepts of science, of climate information by looking at how people receive information. So I recommend this article. Um, I, I'm not going to give all the goodies away, but it's something I think everybody should read, and it's a little lengthy. I just want to warn you. Um, so in terms of public opinion research, who knows what that means, or how would you define that? Jorge. Public opinion? Public opinion research. If I just said that, what would it mean to you? Exactly, exactly. And it's fundamental to communications around climate because when, you know, we refer to it as the C words now because we've learned from public opinion research that when people hear the term climate change, they have all these preconceived notions. And sometimes they're negative and sometimes they're positive. Sometimes it's just, I have no idea what that means and I'm gonna nod my head and pretend. So you really wanna understand what people's attitudes are, what they think and don't think about certain things. So public opinion research is so key. And what we've learned, and I'm gonna actually give you some practical applications of this, um, through public opinion research, okay, is more about how we reach people. Um, by figuring out what we know about them. So starting in your own backyard, I just want to highlight some public opinion research that's come right out of here. Um, and who's seen the Six America study? Yay! This is so valuable, and it's valuable for a couple of reasons. One, because it, it's done more than once, <laughs> and you can see change over time, but it also gives you a sense of the different segments of folks in America who you're talking to. And if you look at, come on, here we go. If you look at uh, persuasive communications across the six Americas, you can see here that the study does a really good job in categorizing six major categories of people and you see the folks that are alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, dismissive. And if you look at this, and you can see the changes, this is from 2009, the changes over the course of the year and wonder, you know, what does that mean for the different groups? Um, who actually has worked on this or has intimate knowledge of this study? What's your name? Now, what do you think are some of the key takeaways? just in your opinion, thinking about how important this is. Very difficult question to answer if you're looking at the top of it. It's, uh, um, I would say some of the key takeaways is that there are extremes in both cases and that we need to sort of look at a deeper level than this top line level for sure to understand how the message to these various people so that you can get in and determine what their values are. And there were some fairly consistent things at the end determining what the values were to drive to get to this meta level um, was pretty critical. Okay, you should be up here because that's exactly right. I think there are the big buckets, but really to understand how to persuade people and move people, you have to dive deeper into understanding what are their values? What do they care the most about? And you know, this is a great study to sort of start you off and, and really give you the mass message of you really need to understand more about each audience. And you know, we, we say a lot there's no such thing as the sort of the general public. Because when you're talking to the general public or investing in campaigns that are to the general public, you're wasting your money. Because what you really want to do is figure out who are you really trying to move. What do you know about what moves them, what they care the most about, and then talk exactly towards that. So I'll get into campaigns that we did that around climate um, in a second. But the other, the other thing that public opinion can, research can show you is the regional differences in, in what people think. And, and when we look at climate change, global warming as a very serious problem, you know, there's some interesting things about the South, 
Um, and uh, if you're talking to folks, if you're doing a regional campaign, it's pretty important to look at regional differences as well because you're not speaking the same language across the different parts of the country. So here's some more public opinion research. <coughs> so one of the things when we were um, talking to folks in the southeast, Josh will, will attest to this, the good news is actually the number when you look at the south um, the number here surprised me when I looked at this, this research because that's not something you actually think about, that the folks in the South actually have a, a pretty high percentage of, <clears throat> excuse me, believing that there's evidence that the climate is changing, <coughs> or the climate is warming, sorry, excuse me. So the other thing that public opinion research will show you is the differences across party lines. And that's particularly important this year because to break through, in sending messages, and this is what I think you guys recognized the most here, you have to really figure out what the, the focus of the media frame is going to be right now. It's the election, a lot of the coverage, people are, are thinking about how, which candidate stands for what. They're just talking about things in the political context in an election year. So looking at the differences across party lines for the things that you're trying to communicate about is particularly important. So here's some more. It actually shows you the changes over time as well. So then you try to figure out why have things increased, decreased? Why are people changing their opinions? What's happened in the year to make this change or this fluctuation occur? Um, one thing that recently came out, raise your hand if you've seen this. Awesome. Oh. Well, great that three people raised their hands, but awesome because everybody should check this out. Again, this is your backyard. It's a really interesting piece about um, voters and their opinions about climate change. So, you know, it's self-evident um, the differences here. I think this makes sense. Um, but what actually is pretty important is looking at the um, undecided voters. It's the big 7%. So why is understanding more about people who haven't made up their mind important to anyone communicating about climate, and especially a candidate? What's your name? OK, why did you think understanding more about undecided voters would be important? You're absolutely right. It's because they're probably the ones that can be swayed, right? If you're trying to persuade people, if they're not sure, I mean, you have folks on this side that know they're voting for this guy, or folks on this side, I'm, I'm settled here, I'm not moving for whatever reasons. The folks you wanna focus on are the folks who you can persuade. And particularly that climate is an important part of the discussion, the undecideds understanding more about what they think about this is, is pretty important. And they actually look a lot like the likely Obama voters. And this study shows you a lot more about that. But if Obama, let's say, wanted to move more people his way who are undecided, he needs to clarify, let's say, his platform on climate, on clean energy, on those things that these people reportedly care about. So figuring out you know, persuasive communications, figuring out what to say to actually move people or change their attitudes, particularly important. Um, so here again, it's just showing you the support for declining fossil fuels. This is something that has been a hot button issue, but here's where people agree actually across lines, which is, which is interesting. Um, and declining fossil fuels, investing in renewable resources. This is sort of the solution, solutions message that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, okay, so thinking about message. I had lunch with some fabulous students this afternoon, uh, none of which I see in the room. Um, I think I just told them everything I wanted to know. Uh, and we talked a lot about uh, effective messages. And the key is telling a story. And you know, I had some folks in there that say, I'm really interested in storytelling as a part of communications around the environment and climate. And you know, being clear about what's at stake when you're talking about climate, it's not even necessarily talking about you know, the planet could, you know, you could not live on the planet in 50 years or 60 years. It's what's at stake for an individual person. 
It's what's at stake for a community member. It's what's at stake for a community. So figuring out how to tell the story includes figuring out what's at stake and how to communicate that using analogies and, and just simple comparisons. All of these things up here you can, you can assume make a lot of sense, but this one, you're nodding, okay. We have a problem here. This is very hard to do for folks likely in this room and who are scientists and who tend to be the messengers on climate. When you look at the other side, they're very, very good at keeping things very short, very consistent, resonating directly with folks' sound bites and those things in a sound bite nation that are actually more effective. So figuring out a way to make things more concise and to resonate more with folks has been a big challenge, especially when it's complex information. So if you're talking about impacts and you're using, you know, science as the foundation for your message, you're already behind the, the eight ball because other times folks are just not. <laughs> They're not using the facts. They're not explaining things well. They're just doing the things that fly over the surface and they know will emotionally connect. So that's a big challenge. Um, and we're gonna talk about some ways to do that, but you know, a great recipe for creating a message in our mind is values, problems, solutions. So building an emotional connection Describing a clear threat, you know, the one, two, and three, but ending on a solution. So how many times have you heard about climate impacts and been left with a feeling of, oh, that is not good. And then that's it. There you are. All right, now what? Um, so that's the problem as well, okay? It's figuring out how to tell a story that might not have a good ending, but figuring out how to tell a story that ends with something that people can do, something that is going to happen or could happen, that's the solution side of it. So I want that in my life. And people, for hundreds of years, have told that kind of a story. That's what resonates with people. Is not just the bad, what's you know the threat, but what's the solution here? So you know, telling real stories with with real consequences is important. And when you look at the the sort of climate story, and talking about that in a way that makes sense to people and is in the story, tell me about the impacts in things that I can make decisions around. So knowing more about sea level rise will help me make decisions about where my summer retirement home will be located so that I feel empowered to actually using this information for a solution that I can, a problem I can solve in my world, but also can be the, the starting point for me to figure out what do I do in general about this. So you look at where are the connections to things people care about. I care about where I'm going to retire. Maybe I want to be on the coast of Florida or some other place where I might not be able to afford insurance down the line. So figuring out those kinds of ways to connect with what people know. And the risks part of it as well, people are used to making decisions in their life that are based around risk. Um, you know, when I'm buying insurance, I know I might not hit a car, but I know I need that insurance. It's, for things that may not happen, but could happen in my life. So it's not even about convincing people that the climate science story is a done deal. Everybody agrees, because that's where there is some controversy. But everybody agrees that there's a big risk. And figuring out how to communicate that, because that is a frame that people know and make decisions around in their lives and change their attitudes about things, change their behavior around things. So figuring out what are the connections that you can make. And again, going back to the story. So stories versus facts. I think people are um, far more likely to read a newspaper story that tells a story that has a hero and a villain and a, a conflict that's trying to be resolved and an ending. And a happy ending is usually what people want as well. So thinking about this, and you know, this has been 
thousands and thousands of years of myths and the way we know we can communicate is tell a story to people. And this is something we need to figure out. And part of the story um, is talking about the good guys and the bad guys. And one of the, the students that I had lunch with made a, just a, a spectacular point. We can get really good about telling the story of the bad guys, the Koch brothers, big oil, big bad, you know, coal. Um, but we don't do a good job about identifying the heroes or making the climate heroes seem cool. Uh, so we talked a little bit about, you know, a new Justice League of climate champions in the sense that, you know, we don't really identify the climate scientists with the hero or the folks like you who are trying to find the next best solution to some of the technological challenges as the hero. Folks like me that can connect more young, not really that young, um, African American people to working in this field and seeing it as something that can make a difference but also something where you learn something new every day. Those kinds of next generation um, climate heroes, we need to figure out how to make them cool. Because right now, that is not happening as much as we're investing in figuring out how to make the big bad guy. So that's another area that a student here brought up to me today. We, we really need to do a better job at formulating that hero in people's minds and not just telling the story about the threat, the story about the big bad guys, but who are we? So another thing here, um, when you say simplify, a lot of people, and particularly folks working on the, anal uh, the analysis side, feel like that means dumbing things down. So a lot of times when you're delivering a message about impacts, about threats, about coal and, and public health impacts, people feel like, you know, oh, if, I'm, if I've got to simplify, that means that I've got to take it to a level where people just, you know, are going to get it, but that really challenges the credibility of the science. Not, not true. It's really, I think people can gr grasp complex concepts as long as you present them in a way that resonates. Again, it's not dumbing down the science. It's not dumbing down the facts. Um, the other thing here I want to point out, what's your name? Ben, do you think that people have become, in our sort of technological society, more or less attentive to longer messages? Exactly. I am also the queen of multitasking, so I don't fault you for that. If I was in the room, I'd probably be doing stuff and hiding it, you know. Um, because we're in that kind of soundbite society, multitasking society, where people have, you have to connect. You have a shorter time to do it. People are getting a percentage of what you're saying. And if you're not saying it in the most powerful way that you know can reach them, you know, why spend your time? So I think that's an important point to make here is that you have less time to make your point. Don't, again, make your answer so long, your message so long, your story so long, 140 characters, just kidding. Um, so the other thing in making the human connection, um, connecting to those values. We talked about the values that people share and thinking about how when you're trying to communicate about environmental um, causes, technology, you need to resonate with all of these. And one that's, that's not on here that I have been noticing more and more, it's that sense of American, just looking at America, American ingenuity, in that we're, we are feeling like we're slipping from being the country that's out in front, that's developing the next technology, that's you know going to the moon, solving the climate crisis, tapping into American sense of wanting to be the best, wanting to be the place where people come to research this, to develop new things. That sense of ingenuity is also something that we need to tap into to get people in the door and then try to connect more and get them motivated to find more information. So that's one thing that is important. Um, and now I'm going to look at a couple of campaigns. I know the reason why I'm here essentially is about talking about climate without using the C words. Um, 
The other thing that came up at lunch, which I know is probably a part of your water cooler or whatever, you probably don't have water coolers, your study room conversation at the, you know, fast food place here, I don't know. Um, but a part of that conversation is whether to even use the words at all. That is still up for debate. I know I have a lot of heated conversations with the folks that I work with, and I think it's yes and no, in my answer. I think there are a lot of places where you don't want to use the C words. And then there are a lot of places where you want to bring them along for the ride and start connecting that dot. Because it's true, at the end of the day, if people are afraid of using the term climate change, then <laughs> we have a lot more work to do than just the technology. So really getting that comfort level higher in places this not, they're just not ready. They're not even, you know, they're so raw, they're not even ready to go in the oven. But I, I do feel, think that there's got to be that parallel universe. So looking at place, looking at types of campaigns that actually don't use the C word. Who knows anything about the sort of coal export challenge? Well, how would you quantify, what's your name, sir? I'm Jim. Jim. How would you quantify what that challenge is right now for coal export? Um, they have to pay uh, people who want to export the coal. Just tell me what you think about it. What do you think we're dealing with right now? Uh, lots of uh, strip mining, uh, railroads, uh, ports on the western coast, uh, shipping uh, uh, material overseas that would be burned and then create climate change. Perfect. Uh, local air pollution. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. And you know, we were working on a, for lack of a better term, campaign that focused on all of these proposed terminals and um, for exporting coal. And we were looking at what's going to be the most effective messaging strategy, communication strategy around this. And surprise, surprise, it was not climate. It was not the consequences globally of exporting coal. It was actually more around the basic community impact and folks that would be impacted on health and safety levels by sitting behind big coal trains. And I used to live in an area that was right around a refinery. And I've sat behind trains that are literally miles long for 15, 20 minutes. And you know, you're multitasking. You're you know, playing games on your phone. You're calling people. You even turn the car off because it makes no sense to sit idle when you're going to be sitting for a while. And the big safety issue is what if I had an emergency? There would be no way to get around this train. There would be no way to get my child to a hospital. So that's one thing, it's just the, the safety issue, the inconvenience issue. I'm a busy person. Even when I've got nowhere to go, I'm a busy, impatient person. And I hate just sitting, waiting on a train. So, you know, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go do whatever I need to do, even if it's absolutely nothing important. But me losing 10, 15, 20 minutes behind coal trains is not, not my friend. Yes? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question because oftentimes we talk about, we get folks coming to us to say, I want to impact the DC, the audience. So do you have folks in DC? We have a DC office, but that's usually not actually the strategy. It's moving the constituencies that these folks represent to put pressure on the way they're making decisions because a lot of times the folks making decisions, if it's you know the community voting to have this, or if it's the decision maker that's voting at the federal level that's representing you guys in DC, it's about you guys and them feeling like they're gonna get reelected or not. So 
Oftentimes it's both, but you, you go for that local, figuring out how to communicate from the local constituency to their representative. We care about this, and if you vote for this, no, guess what? You're not gonna be back here, or you're not gonna be back there. Um, so it's, it's a combination of both. So oftentimes it's that local strategy that moves that DC policymaker. And looking here, you know, it was that community, local community issue. It was also at the end of the, so first it was safety, inconvenience, you know, we're all impatient, tap into that impatience. Um, but then it was the public health, the ash that's falling, coal ash that's falling off trains. It's in your water, it's in your face. And, you know, also using, and this is another piece about how to do this effectively, using the right images. So, you know, moving coal is a dirty, dangerous, and in some cases, if you look at that woman, loud situation. So you look at this coal train that's passing by this restaurant, who wants that? Um, and who wants that for 10, 25 minutes when they're there to enjoy lunch? Um, and the other thing that factored into this campaign was also the untrustworthiness of the coal companies and looking at people's sense of fairness, tapping into that feeling that these guys aren't playing on, you know, they're putting profit before people. Um, and and if, if it's a job story, we can do a better job than this if we're trying to create jobs. This is not the way to do it. So it's, it's a lot of those different kinds of factors when you're thinking about what to talk about. Um, and at the end of the day, climate really didn't enter into the picture. So knowing more, again, the public opinion research helps a lot of the campaigns. So Josh referenced a coal-fired power plant retirement campaign. We've been working with an alliance of, of different groups who seven years ago were focused on fighting new coal, fighting proposed power plants. And in that case, it was messaging where you're choosing between new, dirty, instead of new, clean. So why choose, if you're going for something new to put in the ground, steel in the ground, why not a new wind farm? Or why not new solar farm? Or why not you know, new different ways to combine efficiency with something cleaner? Why choose a new coal plant if you're going to invest millions of dollars? Um, so that was actually a challenge that we were quite successful with, with the right kind of messaging and messengers. Now the movement, quote unquote, is looking at taking existing coal plants offline. So why would you think, Minnie, that, sorry, I'm picking on you again, that that would be harder? Ding, ding, ding. That's right, because now you're looking at stuff that's already a part of the community. This coal plant is sponsoring little league teams. You know, it's Bubba Joe's job down the street. It's not some new guy's job, I don't know. Um, these are the people I know. This is the brand that's been purposely embedded in our community. They give money, you know, they have programs that benefit people. So in general, you're taking that out of a community. And a lot of times renewable energy as the sort of replacement is not something people have confidence in is going to be able to fit that need. So you've got a messaging challenge here. You've got a challenge of figuring out how to get through to people that renewable energy is real, it's here, it's working, it's possible, and that's the, the replacement. But then you're, you're talking about Bubba Joe, you know, the guy who goes to work at the plant every day, and how do we message around that? So a lot of that has been looking at the public opinion research on, you know, what do people actually think? about clean energy versus coal. So again, I'm gonna just motor through these so we can get to questions. Um, but you know, looking at, do people actually agree that renewable energy is a solution? Um, and if you look at these, you know, people quote unquote strongly agree, you know, and totally agree, <laughs> all of those things. Um, and solid majority support closing coal. So all of these things, were a part of several focus groups and polls that were done. Again, credit to Dave. Um, so credit to Public Opinion Strategies and um, FM3, as, as they're affectionately known, some great firms that have done this across the country. 
um, just looked at opinion research. So going to the dynamics on coal retirement, looking at voters of color, young voters, who am I talking to, Republicans, Democrats, and breaking it down that way to figure out you know, what am I going to say and you know, is it going to fly, or where, um, you know, where does renewable energy fall in the priority, who are the sources of jobs um, around this and, and thinking about who's affected. Um, so you know, also looking at place-based polling and you know, even in coal states like Montana. We actually do a lot of work in Montana and you know, this is a place that you look at who are, again, who are the most powerful messengers. In some campaigns we've done the hunters and anglers, so folks you know, out shooting the bucks who want, and the deer and whatever people shoot, um, they want to make sure that they have that protected, you know, environment space that they can be, they can have the lands protected, that's one aspect of this. Um, also making sure that the air is clean, that a lot of their, their prey, their kill won't be dying off. A lot of the changes that happen when, in the case of new coal, um, where folks that are taking land away or planting uh, or starting new parts of a business that's not going to be clean but contribute to more of the, the clean air challenge. All of these things factor into um, where are you, who's the right person to be the messenger, and what kind of movement can you build and where. So going back to um, the coal fire power plant retirement, um, I'm just going to flip through a little more of this information. Um, this is the other thing about this. When I say that the long term, a big challenge, I think that whatever you're talking about here, whether it be renewable energy, coal, climate change has, is that long term story. So, um, you know, why would Tyler, why would you think that sort of long term aspect is a challenge for communications? Very simple as that. They don't. In fact, if they think past, you know, tomorrow or this week or this month, especially in this economy, that's, you know, a stretch. I think people are concerned with what's going to change now or next year. And a lot of times we quantify things in the long term where, you know, in the long term, if we invest in renewable energy, we're going to have this. Well, what can I have tomorrow? <laughs> what can I have if I'm taking this coal plant offline next year? What will be able to be there? So the aspect of, of answering those questions, it's often a challenge of talking about things that you know, require a lot of decision-making changes to happen. Um, so that's a big red flag around how you're talking about jobs, how you're talking about renewable energy coming online, um, and also around climate change. When you're talking about impacts, um, there are a lot of things that we know are likely. And a lot of people want to know, what's going to happen to me in 10 years? What's going to happen to me next year? So that's also something to consider when you're doing, a, you're creating a story, you're creating a message, is how do you quantify something in terms people can understand or care about? In small amount of information in the next 10 years, what we've observed over the past five years, people have been alive five years. They haven't been alive 50 years. So figuring that out is also very important. So also what people are willing to pay is important. That part of, of opinion research is, is important. I'm going to motor through these because I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. So read fast, and these will be posted somewhere in the future. Um, so the other thing is what doesn't work is trying to sell something in a way that people know is not true. Um, you know, for, for me, this is a big one because credibility is key whenever you're, you're talking to folks. If people feel like, yeah, yeah, not going to happen, um, they're going to shut down from you or think that, you know, you're trying to spin them. So when you put things in a frame that either you can't prove or that there's no evidence around, sounds good, but it's likely not going to come true, you're, you're also sort of dooming yourself from, from having credibility in someone engaging with you around the solutions viability. 
So that's the key. It's that dialogue. You want to have someone interested in engaging with you. And when they don't believe what you're selling, um, you know, you're done. So trying to figure out things that people don't, trying to communicate in a way that people don't buy, it's important to know that as well. So here we go. When you, we talked a little bit about air quality standards. And here on our coal fire ret retirement campaign, one of the economic frames, as we call it. So I hate to use words that I call jargon, but I feel like you get me when I say frame. So when I say frame, what's your name, sir? Charlie. Charlie? What do you think I mean when I'm saying frame? Yeah, I mean, it really, in communications, that's the other thing you have to think about. When words mean different things to different people, and you say them, and you're talking in a way that you get, the people here in whatever Yale School of Climate, Forestry, you name it, get, because they hear them all the time. But then the person you're talking to may have no idea what you mean by that or make up their own meaning. So when I say frame in communications, I mean, you're, you're sort of putting something in a, a way people can understand. You frame it in a narrative box where you know you're connecting with their values, where they're from, what you know regionally about where people, what people believe where they're from, um, in the lens, I would say, of, of prosperity, of freedom. So you're entering the door through a different, in a different way than you would by just talking about climate or using the word frame. People think frame means what you put around artwork. So figuring out how to not use those terms like I did, I was just, you know, doing a little example there of what not to do. Um, but thinking about that as well is important. So going to, again, speeding through these, where I want to land is another way of looking at what we know about issues. One thing that we do is looking at how the media represent issues in what we call a media audit. And you look at articles about a certain issue over a period of time. And you say, OK, in all of these articles, how was this issue represented? Who was quoted? So who's talking? Um, where? And then what's missing? So let's say if you're working on a campaign and you're trying to figure out who are the most influential voices on this, oftentimes it's not necessarily the folks that are quoted the most, but you can see if you know, let's say, minority groups or tribal groups or others who are most affected um, on the issue, let's say, of coal fire reti retirement are going to be powerful messengers. And you look at the media over time, and you see none of them are quoted in articles, but the power plant is in their backyard. That's an area of need. That's an area of action. That's an area of movement. So figuring out what you need to do is also a science in communications for movements, figuring out how I can actually break through. I look at messengers who I know will be effective, but they're not that represented. So that's a huge part of it as well. So we look at how, in the media, things are being represented who's talking. Um, so in the case of coal-fired power, power retirement, it's regulators, utilities, investors, electeds, rate payers. Um, so we look at the mix of stories. Who's winning in the story? You know, going back to that storytelling, who's the hero? Who's the villain? Um, what are people saying? So quickly, I'm going to shift, because we're likely all here for education to that difference, I'm going to underscore that difference between educational communications and persuasive communications. So even if you're trying to just inform people, there's actually a way to do that in a way that works and a way to do that in a way that's not so effective. So I'm just going to show you a few examples of that here. Um, so you know, again, using people and places to talk about drought as a climate impact. This mom's clean air task force is great at that. And they bring the funny. They have a slew of political cartoons that are hilarious, that demonstrate you know, the impact on kids. So they have a, the recent one on their site is um, a classroom. And it's the teacher saying, so uh, raise your hand and tell me um, how many of you, you know, 
did something that didn't require your inhaler this summer. So it's, you know, it's funny, um, but it, it actually makes a point. So there's a way to inform people about impacts that um, is funny, is clever, um, but also gets, it resonates. So, you know, anecdotes, I think for me, stories about my family and the way they connect with things. I was talking to my mom about this project that we're doing um, that's trying to get more weather casters to make the link uh, between the weather, extreme weather, and climate change. And, you know, they're in your living room. They're, you know, your guys, your ladies, who you see every day. They're talking about your community. You know them. You feel like you know them. You know, they, they feel like your family. And so those folks making that link in just sharing information, not having any judgment about it, not trying to persuade anyone, is a powerful, powerful tool to us connecting with a broader audience. So I was you know, sharing this with my mom, and she's like, oh, you should talk to Al. You should so talk to Al, Al Roper. I don't know if any of you know him, but he's the weather caster, I guess, on Good Morning America. I don't really watch it. But my mom, you know, big fan of then Willard Scott, big fan of these guys. So they connect really directly with them. And I also use my family as a barometer because figuring out what connects with them, I am absolutely not from the green family. You know, we are energy wasters. We are, you know, from the folks that have never seen this as their issue. And figuring out if I'm making any sense with my own family is particularly important, but also using them to tell stories. And most people are seeing the changes around them, and they're trying to explain them with information. And using those, those changes, those average people, it is really important in connecting with more of the, uh, more of the same. So again, here's, here's a, another way to talk about something in a way that resonates and finding those you know, catchy phrases, um, like it's junk food for fish. We were talking about nitrogen pollution. And junk food for fish sounds a lot better than nitrogen pollution, but it gets people in the door with understanding what you're talking about. So this is another connection um, that is important in how you actually inform. So making yourself quotable is, is important, um, and that's another way to do it, finding those catchy phrases, but crafting key points, not burying what, what's important. Scientists, this is my favorite thing that you have to just sort of pull out of people. They like to talk about what we don't know before what we know. Well, we're not certain, the certainty level is this, and the certainty is that, and we're not really sure what's gonna change. Okay, what do you know is going to change? Talk to me about what your study you know, shows me first. Um, and if I ask you a question that involves you talking about variability or uncertainty, great. But in most cases, like I said, Soundbite Nation, their reporters or whomever you're talking about is going to take whatever they remember, or even just the first part of what you say, that's it. So figure out a way to tell me what you know, what's important about this. Um, and again, on educational communications, some things that, that really work and don't work. Here's an example of a lesson learned. Why would this be a lesson learned? Something that you want to avoid. Jorge, do you know? Anybody? Why would this be not a great way of talking about? Who doesn't want to be warm? You know, just a degree of warmth. Who doesn't want that? You know, you're, you're, you're stating a fact, but it doesn't sound bad. It doesn't sound like something where there's a risk. I mean, it's, it's just a degree of warmth. So for me, that's, that's definitely minimizing the situation. Um, and here's another example of a lesson learned. It's talking about what you can't do first. Um, and, you know, if we had 30 years of data, it, okay, this is, these are actual quotes. I'm not going to name names here, but these are actual quotes in major publications from climate scientists who are trying to inform, and they're just not doing their best at delivering the information. 
The other thing here, um, you know, the person here, he, he used um, entirely negative wording. So it's exceedingly likely that climate change will affect some weather, weather extremes would be the positive way to say this. I mean, okay, well, this person chose it's exceedingly unlikely that climate change will not affect some weather extremes. The same thing is it's exceedingly likely that climate change will affect some weather extremes. Okay. Um, I assume that's come from a climate scientist. Yes, it has. And you can't just turn that around and say it's exceedingly likely that something will change. Like it, most likely the climate scientists are very particular about the words, and that's come from the paper. And so, and, and they've used some sort of statistical proof, and so which doesn't necessarily mean that you can just reverse it. Not so, necessarily, but in some cases, in some cases it does. Yeah. And in this case, it did. And, and you have just demonstrated the greatest thing that I wanted to demonstrate is that scientists live by a totally different set of rules. Yeah, and really absolutely. Absolutely. And my only point with this is that before you deliver that data this way, think about can you say it in a stronger way. And in this case, it was possible. But that's the training part. Just rip scientists out of that when talking to the media or actually communicating across many outlets now. You don't have time to use this kind of language because, you know, people, but you're absolutely right. It's a different way of living life. It's around, you know, accuracy, the process scientific facts, presenting them exactly the way that's accurate in the document and not changing words at all. And you can imagine the challenge around that with the other side who don't play by any of those rules and resonate a lot more strongly with people who don't get this or don't hear about it as much and don't question things. So I feel like there's, there's that, you know, bringing are credible messengers on climate science who are really trying to assess data and deliver it and inform to figure out a way to do that that plays by the right rules um, but is more effective, if that makes sense. And you, that was a perfect question. So um, yeah, definitely not saying make things inaccurate, but the challenge is finding a way to make it higher, it ha make the statement higher impact. Um, thank you. Uh, so here's another example of something that, um, that I would translate into this week's heat wave is a preview of what we know we're going to see more of in a warming world. So this same statement, if someone asked me, oh, does, you know, it, this, does this Seattle's last week's heat wave in Seattle mean that Seattle's gonna have another heat wave like this next year. Well, this week's heat wave is a preview of what we know we're gonna see more of in a warming world. And that's it. You know, you don't have to say, well, we can't pinpoint that to a certainty. There's no way to measure that for Seattle. Yes? So, I mean, you're, there's a balance here. So if you're, you're say, you, what you're talking about is being persuasive. Mm -hmm. And if, you're, if this statement is coming from the scientific community, then to say what you said would be not credible. And then there was a point you made earlier that credibility is important. Absolutely. So if you, if you make yourself sound credible and then you're, you're falsified a week or two later by, by another statement or some other scientific fact, then you lose. So this idea of being persuasive can't ignore the facts. Absolutely and that's, right. And that's a fact. And anything, that is a any, fact. anything to say anything beyond that at this moment in time is not a fact, you know, it's not credible. So I actually love that question as well, because I know it comes from someone who's invested in the science and the credibility of it, and that is a key. But I think that most scientists who would be asked that question, and in this case, this scientist as well, by saying this this week's heat wave as a preview of what we know we're going to see more of in a warming world, wouldn't believe that that statement is not accurate. I don't know about that. I mean, they, they, you, don't, you wouldn't be able to say that 
with any certainty, and, you, and you'd have to probably say something like, it's probably unlikely. <laughs> well, and see, that's that the that difference, and that occur. underscores the difference. <laughs> you're not, if you're talking to the scientific community, yes, but in this case, he's talking to a media representative who's quoting him in an article, and this week's heat wave is a preview of what we know we're going to see more of in a warming world, actually is exactly what the report was about. Um, and I feel like that, uh, you know, that that statement is appropriate for the outlet. Mm -hmm. so, uh, what do you object to? Do you object to the, the phrase, we know we're going to see more of, or you change it to, I'm not we objecting, expect, we but which expect we, to see more of? I mean, this is an accurate statement, so I'm not objecting to anything that was said there. But I, I'm thinking for, because there's, there's nothing, and they, they sort of go hand in hand. That's it's, absolutely right. And I'm not saying this is inaccurate. I'm just saying it's not the best statement for the, the for the context, for, for the medium. Yeah. Well, I guess my, my feeling is that heat, heat waves are very low, a sort of a local phenomena. And you know, it's, it could be a regional phenomena as well. I guess it depends on what we're talking about. But if it was a heat wave in the Northeast and I said, well, you, this is what we can ex expect to see, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily be accurate for you know, 50 years. And so then my credibility is at stake by saying something like that. I could say, you know, zonally. I mean, I could say something really vague, because that's the fact. But I don't think I could say something very specific, because I don't know what the hell the answer is. I, and I don't know. I guess that's the problem. When you're asking yeah. scientists to be spokespeople and to be persuasive, you're not going to get better than that. But see, Otherwise, again, you, going back to the difference between persuasive communication and educational communication, this is not along the lines of persuading people. It's about how to deliver the information. And you know, the scientist is not trying to persuade anyone, quite frankly. He's trying to deliver the information in a way that people will understand. And I think this one, you know, again, goes to what we, we can't know, what we can't blame, what we can't do. We know in this report, the State of the Climate Report, shows that we're going to see more of this in a warming world. And it doesn't go into the pinpoint of it's going to be right here, it's going to be right there. Um, but what we found by looking at the trends over decades and you know, what we know we're going to see more of as a result of these trends is heat waves like this in a warming world. He's not talking about here, there, wherever. Um, and it's not inaccurate, but it makes a stronger statement for his quote. And I completely agree with you. And my point back to your question is this is the challenge in educational communications around climate change, is figuring out how to find that balance before you go into the area of inaccuracy and violating credibility, which is fundamental, especially as, science, as scientists, as communicators, as messengers. But it's also being able to deliver that information to more than just scientists. So I don't think we're there. <laughs> I don't think we've answered it today, but I think we have a lot of work to do. Yes, Tyler. So, well, I think there are some scientists that I would point to that are be able to better deliver information. If you were to ask me who's a hero in the climate science community, I would only be able to point to heroes that are heroes for the climate science community. And again, public information research is also key to know who's vilified outside of that community and know that that person shouldn't be held up as a hero. So I would say we have a lot of work to do in not pointing to someone, but to creating more heroes that are diverse, that are credible, and that speak to more people than the ones we have. And the, the three that you named, I think, are fabulous in talking to the base and carry a lot of weight, are able to inspire, which is key, and I think are, are necessary and valuable. And even James Hansen, who I think has done amazing things over the past you know, five to 10 years at bringing more people into the fold, is becoming one of those pigeonholed people in his community. So even heroes have you know, a lifespan. They're not like Batman or Superman who keep returning you know, 
in re, re sequels and things. I think that as the society changes, I think we have to make new heroes and we have to define them as cool to more people. So I'm sorry I can't point to more people. I can point to some people that we've worked with who are like Chris Field, who master in, he's an IPCC scientist, co-chair co of Working Group 2, who just has this way of speaking about, about the different factors of what the work he's assessed looks like, the impacts of climate change, and communicating it in a way that is much more effective than people I've seen. I can actually show you clips where he's been in interviews where he gets an interviewer who's trying to make him say something, trying to get him worked up. And he seems, he has this way of saying things simply, of remaining calm, of just feeling like your uncle who is talking to you and not like some guy in an ivory tower. His job is just to crunch data and look at, you know, changes scientifically. But someone, you know, you would eat Christmas dinner with. So I feel like he's, he's one of the heroes, I would say, in being able, as a scientist, to be a good communicator. And uh, I just think it comes with time, and it, those kinds of changes. Yes? Uh, my, my secondary point, and just to say, is the answer to Tyler, and I think you can answer. Um, I call your attention to this gentleman out in California, I think his name is Leslie Mueller. Mueller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's done great work. In fact, he's. No, I mean, by people, excuse me, like you or others, I mean, that was a minor story. I mean, the media played it as minor. Why wasn't it more major? That could be, that could be, but anyway, this is an ancillary point, but I just wanted to bring it up. This and he's great as well, and he's he's got some great analogies that I repeat all the time that have been on NPR and the, the, the channels that actually allow him time to, to cover these things and talk to people. So he's another one, absolutely. But my major question is this, and in, in, in response to this gentleman here, uh, professor, I guess, I'm sorry. Um, I think, as a lay person, the scientific community has a responsibility, not only, obviously, to be accurate in their findings, but to work with people like... Chiari, so, it's not easy. Uh, to come up with facts that you can, that she could use, that could help her persuade people that climate change is happening or is inevitable, whatever, whatever words you want to put, uh, as, as opposed to, and I'm not saying you were doing this, but as opposed to saying, well, that's not quite accurate. Uh, let's be positive about it. I mean, I, I'm not criticizing you enough. Just, matter if you, whether you're criticizing me or not. I, my, my feeling is that scientists, that's not a scientific role. You know, we could be co-opted to, to, to be a public speakers, perhaps. We're not going to make very good ones, you know, but if that's the message you want, this is how we sound. But the facts and all the stuff we do is all published and out there and ready to roll. Take it and do it, everything you want with it. It's right there. But if you want us to actually open our mouths, right, and say something, then we have our community who is right behind us saying, what the hell did you just say that for? You know, and you know, we are constantly being, or we're constantly thinking about what the rest of our community is going to say when we minimize the facts to some little nugget and, and send it off into space. We're always thinking, oh, that's totally inaccurate. I hope I don't get, catch a lot of crap the next time I go to a, to a meeting. And so we are very careful because we are attacked by our colleagues all the time. We're not rewarded for being to, sim to simplify facts. We are criticized for simplifying facts. So if you're asking us to do it, you're, you're basically asking us to take a risk, and that's what Hansen does. He takes that's a risk right. all the time, and other scientists chide him for it and bust on him all the time. It's not something that you know, he walks away with feeling very good about. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, I agree that there's a, there's a definite negative aspect to it, but the bottom line for me is that the, the big picture is how are we going to deal with this problem? I mean, how are we going to convince enough people in this country and around the world that this is, this is something that's going to... And before we move to the next question, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's looking at the combination between 
educational information and how we can deliver the information more powerfully and the folks who are actually trying to persuade people and finding a way to integrate both and to do, you know, to actually move. And I hear exactly what you're saying. It's about maintaining credibility within your community as much as maintaining credibility for the information. But I will say the late Steven Schneider has done a really good job at helping other scientists figure out those communication challenges or just, or just actually entertain a dialogue around them. And there's a lot more work going on right now to really figure out this in the scientific community. So I feel like there's at least more dialogue around how can we you know, not look at people who do this as pariahs or as, you know, doing the wrong thing, but as helping to, you know, at least share information more effectively. Yes, I'm sorry, what's your name? Maybe one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one, we have time for one. Okay. It's not a question so much as a comment, but you never write an abstract. You either have a positive or a negative spin or you're not worth publishing to most journals or, or even scientific communities. There's always something positive and negative in there. And if you can't put that into simple terms for the public to understand what that means, it's essentially what your abstract is for, whether your public's a scientific public or it's the non-existent general population, then you're not doing your job. I mean, that's, that's a personal opinion. There's, there's articles that I read and I go through different conferences. Their abstract doesn't say anything positive or negative, no matter how interesting the material and their procedure might be in the middle. It's trash. And scientists remain very credible information messengers on this issue, more so than politicians, more so than you know a lot of the other folks that are in this frame. So it's, I often talk about this, that it's as much your job as a scientist to assess the information, do your job, talk to your community, as to figure out ways to deliver that information credibly and succinctly to more people. So a lot of folks see that as someone else's job, but as, a trusted messenger in a lot of cases, and public opinion research does go to show this. It's kind of your job as well. Oh. Just before we go off this topic, could we flip that though? Uh, look at that statement and take a different statement. It says, we had a very cold winter last two years ago in the Northeast. Global warming can't be happening. And I think that's. So then you, then you would respond with that statement, right? Well, and I think that's a good question because oftentimes people see global warming as just the warming aspects of it, but we know differently. We know that it's a combination of different kinds of impacts that actually that cumulative effect, the difference is, is a great way to introduce people that you know don't think it's just about this, it's about many things. And to understand more about the different kinds of impacts we'll be seeing in a warming world, you should just try and find more information. And here's where you go. And so I feel like you're not, trying to convince people but to open people and engage them into what should you care about. You should care about whether you're going to be able to ski, whether you're going to be you know, under several inches of snow, whether you're going to have drought conditions, floods, whatever. There's a lot of information out there. And where do you go to get it? It's kind of the open, opening the door, not delivering all the facts and doing it in a scientific way. It's how do you engage people to believe you and to understand what's at stake or understand what's changing and to find more information. Yes. great spokespeople and climate heroes and folks working in coal fields across the country who are wonderful heroes who will never make it on PBS and CNN and Fox because Zach and Cosby are great heroes and they're great spokespeople and they work for Greenpeace and they're Nature Conservancy and they're intelligent and smart and they're not encumbered by being scientists. But so they're not I agree we have to do a lot more to push out a lot more but let me also going back to my mama 
tell you something she said to me when we were having this conversation the other day. You know, I saw this piece on the Today Show, and there were these farmers, and the farmers are talking about how they can't, you know, plant their crops at the same time, there's a drought, and so they're having to sell their cattle for, for just meat, and these poor farmers. And I was just saying, you know, she saw a piece where a farmer was talking on the Today Show. So things are changing and people are understanding, at least in the sort of media world, how to resonate better with people, even if they're corporate funded, let's say. But yes, recognizing the interests behind a lot of these owned companies, recognizing, you know, if you're going to be quoted and you know you're going to be quoted, don't give a lot of information and things you can't do and have that be the quote. Um, all of those things are important to consider when you're delivering information, is what do I know about the consequences of people who take the last half or the first half of what I say? So what I say has got to be succinct. I've got to have my key points say them exactly the way I would want them printed and nothing else. So a lot of times people don't realize that as a scientist and they'll get into an interview and they'll just keep going on and on about all the different things that go into the certainty levels or what we don't know. And all they'll take is what we don't know. And again, it's recognizing the medium and knowing go into that interview, having practiced your key points and reporters love the silence. So they will be silent and not ask you another question just to make you feel like you need to keep talking. So even the delivering the information is about understanding the possible pitfalls. So don't keep talking. They'll break the silence. It's not about you. Um, it's about what you're trying, the information you're trying to deliver without it possibly being mis miscommunicated, crafted, skewed. So it's a lot of those just you know, best practices. And I'm so sorry that we've gone so far over time that we did not get the rest of the um, the presentation or the dessert, as I call it, where I actually like to end with the, the positive, um, the solution story. But again, I promised to put these slides online so you could see more examples of how to deliver. So here we didn't even get to the best practices of how to deliver climate information in a way that um, you know, is more compelling, is more you know, resonating with people's cultural and um, key values, all of those things. So my bad for keeping it going way too long on all of these slides, but um, I'm, just the, I'm just the appetizer in this speaker series. So you're gonna be getting a lot more um, in the next few to four speakers to think about, and I'm just sort of planting the seed, wetting the appetite. So, that's a good question, and because the, do you, can you answer that? Yeah, today my big face is on there, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, that website has the speaker series and it talks about then, you know, all of them, or hopefully it'll talk about the rest of them. So I'll find a way to get this to you and uh, it's actually a little longer. But it has some good public opinion research in there. It has some good just kind of lessons learned, stuff you already know, no aha moments, but a, a way to package it to help you remember it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jorge.